This is interesting stuff. This is from EIR, which is Executive Intelligence Review, which you should check into. There is just a wealth of uh, sources and information that you're not going to find. Certainly, you're not going to find it in institutional academia. And yet, it's all documented. It's all very well researched and backed up. Um, I remember, this is uh, the LaRouche organization, and I remember they kind of made fools of themselves because they would park themselves at airport in airports, you know, in, in public, uh, public areas, and they would set up tables and they would confront people, they would go up to you and say, talk to you about if you understood uh, that the British Empire still lived and still exerted huge control and in fact controlled the United States. And because of their kind of aggressive, uh, clueless tactics vis-a-vis -vis public relations, um, unfortunately a lot of people um, want to automatically discredit the um, a tremendous amount of, of research and scholarship that still goes into the LaRouche organization. And I recommend everybody please read EIR, go to the website, Executive Intelligence Review, put aside whatever uh, preconceptions you might have, whatever prejudices. It's so easy these days to disqualify and, and dismiss people because of, uh, rather, for superficial reasons. And, uh, you know, I have friends who, you know, they're like, oh, the LaRouche, or, oh, come on, that's LaRouche, that's LaRouche. As if that has any substance or any meaning. Yes, it's LaRouche. Yes, I remember them in the airports. Yes, uh, it startled people, the claims they were making, even though, as far as I can tell, uh, they're absolutely spot on, and we can't, you got to take the gold where you find it. So I, I've been doing these uh, videos on uh, Le Comte de Saint-Germain and the French Revolution, and I found this amazing article, and I'm trying to find, discover this through line. It's been several weeks since I made a video, and I'm through feeling guilty about it. Uh, I've been, you know, getting into alchemy, and <laughs> I, have, I have no at natural inclination for this subject, but, you know, uh, we're still not finished there. I'm not going to dismiss alchemy. I'm saying it's an important part of our story. But let's go back to the American Revolution. Interesting article, Why France Did Not Have an American Revolution by Pierre Baudry. In 2001, EIR published the author's report on the life of the Benjamin Franklin of the French Revolution. This was the extraordinary French patriot and scientist Jean-Sylvain Baye. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. My French is terrible. 1736 to 1791. Ah, huh. I wonder if he was executed. Um first president of the First National Assembly of France and organizer of the Marquis de Lafayette's National Guard. Very important. During 1789, Bailly and Lafayette attempted to carry out a peaceful, quote-unquote, American Revolution in France and establish an American representative and constitutional republic, though retaining a constitutional monarchy, in collaboration with Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, and then Ambassador to France, Thomas Jefferson. Baye, in 1789, both France's leading astronomer and her leading patriot was a follower and historian of Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, from whose work the very, from whose works, the very idea of, quote, the pursuit of happiness in the American Declaration of Independence was traced. Baye and Lafayette's Revolutionary Society of 1789 was consciously based on that Leibnizian principle. I'm, I'm not aware of that. 
I know uh, Leibniz's figures uh, very prominently in uh, LaRouche's organization. I guess they see him as kind of the true pole, the true North Star, uh, in opposing Isaac Newton as a fake, well, Isaac Newton being, being the fake, uh, and Leibniz being the, the real inventor of, of the calculus. I think it is perhaps unfair to dismiss Isaac Newton in this way. I think Isaac Newton, uh, my God, he's a, he's a giant. And after his death, they, they published a work in which he calls into question, using m mathematics and astronomy, pretty much everything we think we know about the ancient world, the ancient chronology, and uh, now, of course, uh, it were soon, you know, at that time and even until today, um, what he maintained was regarded as kind of the rantings of a kind of um, an older gentleman who perhaps has had a touch of dementia. But in fact, he did write the work a little bit earlier in his life, and no one has been able to debunk or discredit. No one dares go near this thing, and I advise everybody. Uh, I'd like to get into it myself. I just haven't had the time. Um, basically, that uh, through the official history has added centuries onto uh, the so-called ancient history. But let's go back here, uh, third paragraph. Our previous article made public for the first time to English-speaking readers the crucial moments that went into establishing the sovereign authority of the National Assembly of France. The true French Revolution, accomplished by Bahia and Lafayette in the crucial actions around the tennis court oath of the 20th of June, 1789, which demonstrated the sovereignty of the National Assembly, specifically imitated the American framers of the U.S. Constitution at their convention in Philadelphia two years earlier in 1787. The sovereign act of constitution of the nation of France was marked on that day by the fact that the majority of the deputies present solemnly swore, quote, not to separate and to meet anywhere that circumstances will permit until the constitution of the kingdom is established. No, not to separate and to meet anywhere the circumstances to, you know, we, we're going to hold, we're going to stick together until this thing is hammered out. It was from the sovereign decisions of the National Assembly voted on June 17th to June 20th, 1789, that a peaceful and Republican French Revolution was possible. And like, you know, Perhaps I've mentioned, you know, we see the Bolshevik Revolution in, in its, at the grassroots level early on. Uh, perhaps there's some legitimacy in the, the spirit, the sentiment. But it quickly is hijacked by intriguers and international banking interests and uh, operatives and assets from the, the, the stateless criminal cabal that governs banking and organized crime and oligarchy and all the rest of that ugliness that tends to swoop in and pervert movements of change, hijack them, which we definitely saw with the, the Bolshevik Revolution, which was just absolutely a, an abominable atrocity. And I think the French Revolution became that too. So here we have the same group of people, actually, the same cadre, the same cabal, uh, just an earlier iteration, the same families, the same ideology. Uh, next, going on, in the present historical study, the author will reveal, in light of crucial historical documents of a period, that the storming of the Bastille was a coup d'etat whose date of occurrence had been chosen to coincide with the mass starvation prepared by British policy of the city of Paris. So there we have it the fine British hand as always, and which we can trace the uh, modus operandi of this, uh, this gang that seems to sort of be centered in London, um, the British oligarchy, which is 
uh, um, you know, what would you call it? It's the Venetian. It's the Venetian hand, having taken having taken command of 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 England and through the Venetian party and 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 empowering British oligarchy with the same kinds of uh, evil. Uh, uh, evil intent. So here we have it, prepared by British policy. The storming of the Bastille of July 14th was an act of anti-American counter, an anti-American counter-revolutionary coup carried out by Finance Minister Jacques Necker, who represented the international banking, bankers. Louis Philippe Egalité, Duc d'Orléans, and the British controllers of Marat, who was a British asset, Danton, Robespierre, Lord Shelburne, and British intelligence chief Jeremy Bentham. Big surprise. Because you know, or you may not know, after the American Revolution, uh, the Revo American Revolution was never accepted by the British oligarchy, at least the results of this revolution. And, you know, you go leap forward, uh, Lord, what is it, Alfred Milner, who went, he set up his round table in, in their uh, guiding document, they say, we, we do not accept the American Revolution. And our intention is to get the United States back into the British orbit under British control, uh, which was pretty much accomplished off and on, mostly on. Which is why I say to uh, many of my students that there's a kind of schizophrenic identity in uh, 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 a schizophrenic American identity, which alternates between simply straight, straight out and out, straight up British imperialism, and actual uh, a kind of um, freedom. Uh, the stated aims and uh, ideals as expressed in the founding documents, mostly I would say freedom is number one. So alternating back and forth between British imperialism, which is absolutely the opposite of freedom, and uh, the American system of freedom and empowerment of the average person. <sighs> okay, it's a lot to take in. Next paragraph. The purpose of a starvation-driven insurrection, which the British are very good at, they've played that out in many places, um, Ireland, the potato famine, not a natural occurrence, it was a British um, plot. The purpose of a starvation-driven insurrection was to bring down the king, the government, the National Assembly, and to put in power a new Jacobin king, Philippe Egalité, with Jacques Necker as the prime minister of a French version of a British parliament, parliamentary monarchy. The following evidence provided by the French writer and witness to the revolution, Félix Louis Montjoie, Joie? oh God, as well as the secret dispatches written by Antonio Capello, the ambassador to Paris of the Doge of Venice, demonstrate that the British dominated historical accounts about the French Revolution have been have lied systematically about the true nature of the circumstances surrounding the coup d'etat of the Bastille. They reveal the most despicable nature and the conspiratorial role of the Duke d'Orléans with his British partners against the American principle of the revolution. It's important to remember that, you know, throughout the 19th century, there was a dueling epistemological struggle in the world, and people acknowledged that you would either go with the British, which was the free trade system, which amounted to, to looting and pillaging and destruction, or you could go with the American system, which was industrialization, building up nations, becoming strong and flexing your muscles and making progress. And these two visions, these two outlooks were dueling 
very much actively in the 19th century, so mostly the late 19th century. <coughs> uh, then going on here, let me see how much. Oh, 15 minutes, pretty good. A secret in plain sight. Montjoie's work is the Histoire de la Conjuration de Louis-Philippe d'Orléans, surnommé Égalité, published in 1796. In its introduction, Montjoie states, quote, No conspiracy has ever been more extraordinary or given birth to more errors, more disorders, more depredations, more assassinations, and more calamities of all sorts than the one that I'm about to write the history of. From this terrible pile of follies, of heinous crimes, of misfortunes, must emerge a great lesson which, if it is understood properly, should make the future of nations wiser and happier. No other work, therefore, from the single vantage point merits to be read with more interest by all sorts of readers. No other work deserves more being meditated on by whomever is called upon, by whoever is called upon to institute or to govern a people. There has to be someone with enough courage to describe to the future generations the follies, the crimes of our current generation. Woe betide whoever was an accomplice to those follies and to those crimes. But if the revelation of this complicity is a fault, it is the fault of history and not of the historian because what I might have omitted to say, someone else might have the opportunity to reveal. End of quote. And we see, uh, unfortunately, his hopes had, has, have fallen flat because misinformation is still the order of the day. Disinformation, misinformation, the truth about the French Revolution is still hidden. The truth about many things still hidden from view. Even the, even the Bolshevik Revolution is, is untouchable, the myth of the Bolshevik Revolution. You can't go near it. You, there's a certain orthodox view of it that, that it remains... Uh, uh, ignorantly inviolate in our uh, uh, public institutions of, uh, of so-called academia. You can't go near it, even though there's so much documentary evidence. There's so much that we could know if we would dig, but there's a kind of um, intellectual mafia, an academic mafia out there that governs, um, that, that governs, you know, um, Mm. Who was it? Supreme Court Justice. His name escapes me. But there he was writing, um, it'll come to me. He was the one who was all about, you know, personal liberty. What's his name? God damn it. <clears throat> William O. Douglas. That's what I was trying to think of. He wrote a kind of controversial work in 1969, and he said that the, you can't get a proper education in the universities because the university system is run by CIA, which was today, if you were to say that, people would say you're a conspiracy theorist, you're completely insane. But uh, people who really, uh, who were in the know, people who weren't afraid, back in those days, those great days of true progressivism, of true liberalism, when it still existed, they were calling out CIA, they were calling out the establishment. So, at any rate, uh, they, but you have to remember, it isn't CIA. CIA is under control. CIA was set up by MI6. CIA are, the, you know, the henchmen. They are, they don't, they are controlled. They, they are, they were set up to control to carry out the will of the people above them. So at any rate, here we have, it looks like the French Revolution was a similar project to the Bolshevik Revolution, shaping the modern era with, uh, with uh, falsehoods and omissions, and also uh, b basically blackballing anyone who expresses any other opinion 
than the, than, than, than the orthodox position. Uh, okay. Next paragraph. And this is, uh, I think we'll, we'll, call it, we'll call it quits here and move on uh, next time. Historical truths are the most difficult to accept because they come into conflict with social beliefs that are axiomatically based on the false assumptions of public opinion controlling a population. The case of the French Revolution is a powerful example of such an historical event that has been entirely fabricated and manipulated for public opinion's consumption. The Jacobin, the Jacobin French Revolution, which was ultimately triggered by the Bastille des Coups, was not only unnecessary, but contained the seeds of Napoleonic fascism detrimental to the nation of France and the rest of the world and should have been stopped by all means available at the time. Okay, we've got 21 minutes, we'll keep going. Um, who was this Jean Sylvain Baye? They have here this little box here. Necker was, we know, was the international banker, which we have definitely the same struggle going on today. Someone by you representing the yearnings of a people to be free and to make progress, and the bankers on the other side hoping to control and uh, create uh, chaos and death and bloodshed for the enrichment of themselves. So we have Baye versus Necker in the French Revolution in this box here. Jean Sylvain Baye was now reduced to the status of an historical footnote, even in France. Yeah, well, even in France, of course. France is a controlled state, controlled by, you know, Freemasons and international bankers and the stateless criminal interests. So he's been reduced to the status of an historical footnote, was at once founding president of the Revolutionary National Assembly of France in 1789, first Republican mayor of Paris, first organizer of the Paris Guard, later General Marquis de Lafayette's National Guard, and an astronomer and Leibnizian historian of science, the first to be elected to both French National Academies of Science, both French National Academies, I didn't know there were two. Hmm. In contrast to today's anonymity of the political leader of the American tendency in the French Revolution, Bayes, Swiss, British Swiss ad adversary in the summer of 1789, Banker and minister Jacques Necker is quite celebrated. The famous storming of the Bastille on the 14th of July, now France's national holiday, was done by collusion of this Swiss banker Necker, who was in process of being dismissed by King Louis XVI as his minister and the Duke and the King's cousin and would be usurper. Uh, Louis Philippe, Duc d'Orléans, known as Philippe Egalité, among the British backed, the British backed Jacobin, quote unquote, revolutionary movements, which he financed. The Bastille uprising provoked by the slaughtering of people in the streets by cannons firing from the Bastille fortress was one act of a coup d'etat aimed at restoring Necker to control of the royal government and at some later point making the Duke of Orléans king. Necker was the Alan Greenspan of Louis XVI's last royal governments. In the aftermath of the notable French military and financial support for the American War of Independence against Britain, a tragedy had occurred. France, in the 1783 Treaty of Paris recognizing American independence, agreed to free trade provisions demanded by Britain for its control of the Atlantic trade. Then, in a separate 1786 French-British treaty, 
France, ex France accepted suicidal complete free trade agreements which ruined the French economy overnight. From 2% annual real physical growth in the late 1770s and early 1780s, France's textile, shipping, and mining sectors and its agriculture fell into depression with outright famines ensuing. The royal budgets collapsed, and in stepped the Swiss agent of Britain's Lord Shelburne, the banker Jacques Necker, as French finance minister and first minister. So, same thing happening today. Same thing. Destruction of national growth and the people's interests and the enrichment and tightening of controls by the international bankers. <clears throat> Necker, through his banking circles in Geneva and London, brought in huge international... This is the IMF, right? Necker, through his banking circles in Geneva and London, brought in huge international loans to fund, to fund the French royal budgets from 1787 on, while subjecting the royal treasury to transparency, quote-unquote, and austerity, word we know all too well. The, the, the starving, actually, the, the, the uh, immiseration of nations to the point where they can't stand, they, can't, they don't have the strength to stand up, they can't possibly pay back any money, and they end up having to borrow more and then give up uh, and their entire, uh, you know, basically give up on any sovereignty they may have imagined that they had austerity. Um, subjecting the royal treasury to transparency and austerity with his famous compte rendu. This was just as with the IMF, I just said that, assistance package to nations today. In short order, Louis XVI regime was at the financial mercy of Necker and the banking interests he represented while the population of France was in revolt against the economic collapse and deprivation. Tragic, really tragic. Necker's ally, the Duke of Orléans, was importing British-trained Jacobin radical writers into Paris, turning the Palais Royal district, which he personally owned, into an anarchist bastion to overturn the French state. They like to use, you know, anarchists and communists and, um, you know, terrorist cells with their contrived and pumped up um, and ho hokey kinds of uh, f philosophies. And they direct these, they, they, they wind up these groups and they set them loose on their enemies from the inside, right? We see the same thing happening today in the United States with um, Antifa and Black Lives Matter. These are contrived artificial groups wound up by the same people. There's, there, there's a continuum, you know. It's the same, or the, the anarchists in the early 20th century up through, you know, Islamic terrorism and, you know. These are artificial, is what I'm saying. One such writer, the infamous Jacobin Jean-Paul Marat, was to be imported from Switzerland, particularly to launch attacks upon Bailly and Lafayette. Necker repeatedly demanded that the king introduce the British system, as opposed to the American system, the British system, a parliamentary monarchy into France, government by the financial and landed aristocracy. So we're maintaining a system that is, um, in its character and very nature, British, but also going back to Venetian, echoing Venetian methods of the Venetian oligarchy. But the estates, meanwhile, transformed and unified themselves into the National Assembly by a partisan of the principles of the American Revolution, uh, the American Republic, was at its head and organizing a citizen's National Guard commanded by the hero of the American Revolution, General Lafayette, to defend it. Louis XVI's desperate last-minute attempt to dismiss Necker couldn't get rid of this bastard, right? 
um, in July 1789, started the Bastille cannons firing into the citizenry in the Paris streets and ended with the mob storming the Bastille and demanding the return of, to power of Necker, the man who had bankrupted France. We see echoes, eerie, eerie echoes of this. They're hoping to pull off something similar to this in the United States. But you could replace Necker, let's say, with George Soros. The amount of chaos they're attempting to direct at a nationalist, um, pr truly progressive leadership by this uh, uh, criminal, international criminal uh, cabal. This was the first step on the path to the terror which took the life of Bailly and drowned the chance of a second American Revolution in France, so feared by the British in blood. So the British were terrified that American ideas would take hold in France and that France would um, accelerate, and overcome, accelerate its progress in the modern world and become a powerhouse and liberate the people and uh, effect a kind of uh, peaceful compromise between monarchy and uh, republicanism. So uh, I guess I'm going on about this because I'm, I'm looking at the, I'm, you know, I'm living in Mongolia now, but my family's in the States and I'm watching anxiously from, from afar and drawing parallels with, uh, I think, very justifiable uh, parallels with uh, similar um, operations from the past. We're here focusing on the French Revolution because this series is about um, the Comte de Saint-Germain, his role perhaps as a Jacobin spy, so we don't know. Perhaps the guy was a, was a bad guy. Uh, but I hope that we're going to rise above, I hope we're going to get above uh, such simple uh, distinctions and get to the truth, get to the heart of this this matter, but this was an important kind of um, what would you call it? Not now, maybe a maybe a kind of a diversion, but necessary to get into to understand the dynamics of the time. Truly, that is not from the point of view of of uh, sanctioned orthodox uh, conventional normy academia. So. We'll get back into it. Uh, hope, hope all is well with, with you guys.